When it comes to planning an investigation or a long feature, there are a number of useful frameworks which can help you plan and organize your work so that you get it done more quickly and more effectively. In this video, I'm going to talk about um, one in particular, which is called story-based inquiry. I'm also going to introduce right at the end a couple of other approaches which might also be useful in planning any sorts of editorial projects. But let's start with story-based inquiry. This is a method which was created by a man called Mark Lee Hunter um, and his book Story-Based Inquiry, which was uh, paid for by UNESCO, is available for free online. So it's really, really useful to get hold of that ebook. It's a, a PDF and use it as a reference manual when you're working on your long stories. It's a hypothesis-driven method. What that means is that the starting point for your story is to come up with a hypothesis, essentially a sort of a headline for your story. We'll look at some examples in a minute. The example, uh, the, the point of this hypothesis, the reason for that hypothesis, is that it ensures you stay focused on the specific ingredients that you need in order to test that hypothesis. In other words, in order to tell that story. The hypothesis might well change. In fact, it probably will change as you pursue your investigation, pursue your story and find out more about the facts. But what it does is really help you frame what it is that you need to know. The other thing about this method is that it often involves starting to map out a chronology. The hypothesis that you come up with will probably relate to the current situation, the present. That's the news that you're reporting. But in the process of looking into that hypothesis, you will start to map out the cause of that situation, the past that's led up to it, and what might happen in the future. That might be solutions. It could also be concerns about further problems. And... One of the easiest ways you can come up with a hypothesis is to actually just take the official version of events. If someone in power is making a claim about how things are or what has happened, then you can take that as a starting point to find out and test whether that is indeed true. A very simple example would be the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, saying that he did everything he could to stop the UK reaching 100,000 coronavirus deaths. A number of reporters have taken that claim as a hypothesis and then started to test it. So in that case, the hypothesis is that Boris Johnson did everything he could to prevent coronavirus deaths. We can work back from that statement to the past and look ahead to solutions as well. Now in the slides to um, this presentation you'll find a couple of videos where uh, I've interviewed the creators of the story-based inquiry method. This first video is a brief interview with Mark Lee Hunter and this was done at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference uh, in Kiev and um, it's only about five minutes but do take some time to watch Mark talking about the method. Mark is a great speaker by the way if you ever get a chance to go and see him um, the Centre for Investigative Journalism Summer School tends to have him every year, then do. Also, Luke Sengers, um, who tends to talk about the same situation, the same uh, framework, and uh, works with Mark. Luke was a co-author on the book and has written on this as well. Um, you'll find an interview with Luke specifically on hypotheses as well. So let's look at what we mean by a hypothesis. This is an example from Hunter's book where we start with a statement, a hypothesis, that basically sums up the story that we're seeking to report. And the story is that corruption in the school system has destroyed parents' hopes that their children will lead better lives. Now, when you write down that uh, hypothesis in black and white, then it forces you to start to make some of these things explicit. Uh, it forces you to start to drill down in terms of what you mean by the different parts of this hypothesis. What are you really specifically talking about in your story? So corruption, for example, what do you mean by corruption? There's lots of different types of corruption, lots of different forms. Um, what will this corruption look like? Where do we look for it? How do we identify it? Likewise, the school system. There are many different school systems. There are different parts of a school system. So which part are we looking at? 
um, is there variation in that school system? Are we looking at different forms of corruption in different parts or is it just corruption in one part? So in the UK, for example, there are academy schools and there are um, non-academies. There are primary schools and secondary schools. There are special schools and so on. What about parents' hopes? What are those hopes? Um, which parents have been affected? Where can we find them? What about the children? Um, are they aware of what's going on? Should they be part of this story? Could we speak to them? How does it affect them? And then right at the end, we've got an assumption here that um, education will help children lead better lives. Well, we need to pin that down. Is that actually true? Does it help children lead better lives? And in what way? What evidence is there for that? That will help us report our story much more concretely in terms of the actual impact of the thing that we're reporting on, the thing that we're investigating, which is corruption or a specific form of it. Here's a second example from the book. One thing I should point out straight away is that the language used by Hunter in this book is not really acceptable. He talks about children growing up with handicaps. He talks about handicapped children. It's not acceptable to talk about um, disabilities with those words. So really what we're talking about is uh, to stop children growing up with disabilities. So with that point made, the hypothesis again here is useful for pinning down concrete terms again. Which doctors deliver babies? Where are we looking? Um, what do you mean by killing a baby? How does that happen? How many babies are born prematurely? Where are they born? Is that number going up or down? What kind of disabilities do these children have? Is that number rising or falling? You'll notice that a lot of these questions are how, what, were, why, when. And that's something that you should try and flesh out as you look at your hypothesis. And that will direct your reporting, direct uh, your news gathering to the places where you can find that sort of information. Another framework which uh, isn't mentioned in Hunter's book, but which I think is really useful when you're starting to do this, is to use the SMART acronym. This is usually used with setting objectives in any sort of project. It's a project management framework. And SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Results-Oriented or Relevant and Time-Bound. Now in project management generally, the SMART framework is used to ensure that you are again focused in the way that you approach your project. But this really works particularly well for uh, an in-depth piece of reporting because uh, for a start you need to be specific about who you're looking for, where you're looking for them, what you're talking about. You need to think about what's measurable. So we've touched on data a few times here. It might be the numbers of babies being born or the amount of money being spent. Measurable also means it might be in documents such as transcripts or reports. It might be measured in recordings. Um, recordings could be video recordings, they could be audio recordings and so on. Uh, they might have been observed in some way. The achievable dimension of your project is basically making sure that you are realistic in what you're setting out to find out. If it's not realistic then try and drill down to a smaller part of it. Uh, quite often people have um, ideas which are, are really too big. So if you think about something like corruption at FIFA, that's an enormous subject and, and people who've been looking at that have been looking for 10 years uh, and along the way they've done lots of stories about different things, different particular instances of corruption or different individuals or whatever it is. So if, if it's a project like that, then try and boil it down to smaller parts and focus on the smaller part first and then move on to the next part. And then the final two are, are really important for journalism. Um, you need to be results oriented. In other words, you need to be focused on getting a story at the end of it. It's no good to have spent two or three months working on an investigation or a big feature and at the end of it you've got lots of different bits but you can't actually pull them together into a story. You need to be focused on that story, the result of your process. Now there'll be lots of information that you don't use and that might be usable in future stories but ultimately you need to be able to produce that story by the deadline and that's the final 
part of this smart framework but you need to be time bound what's your deadline how long are you going to spend on this make sure that you set yourself a deadline and let that uh, make sure that you do actually produce a story rather than let it go on and on and on and take up all the time that it can now sources are a particular challenge when it comes to large editorial projects um, and again hunter has some useful advice on strategies for finding and approaching sources broadly what he recommends is to start with the easy sources and then work inwards towards the harder ones and he divides up sources into three broad types the first type is what you would describe as open sources this is reports and documents that are available on the web or from libraries and archives it might be data which is available um, and you don't need to request access to that or it's um, not difficult to get hold of then he talks about experts experts are probably likely to be academics but they might include archivists or charities or other people with subject expertise now they're not as easy to access as documents and data but they are easier to access than the final level which is broadly the idea of human sources now obviously experts are human but what we're really talking about here are harder to find human sources the most common example would be a case study someone who's been affected by the issue that you're looking at but it might also include people who work within an organization potential whistleblowers for example it might involve um, people who are relatives of the case studies it might involve former employees or witnesses to particular events those are all examples of human sources and there's lots of advice in the book about finding and working with those but what hunter suggests is that you start with the easier sources and work inwards and in fact you, that you map out the uh, network of people and actors that are involved in your in the issue that you're looking at so again with his example of children with disabilities he's put them right at the center of his diagram and then worked outwards from those to the people that are in, in touch with those so we've got the parents we've got the doctors hospitals regulators and so on and he's placed them intentionally as well so the doctors in this diagram are in between the parents and the hospitals because the doctor is in touch with both of those and in fact acts as a sort of a go-between between between the parent and the hospital the hospital is reports the regulator so the regulator is next to that and so on and uh, what hunter says basically is that you know the center is who the story is ultimately about so in this case the story is ultimately about children with disabilities every other source we might speak to fits around them and they're all connected to each other but the key point here is that if one source is blocked you can go to another source who can see past the obstacle so it's a way of finding your way around to the sources that you're trying to reach one consideration to flag up at this point is that you might be considering or uh, involved in a story that involves the use of personas or subterfuge or lurking or going undercover in other words anything that doesn't involve you being explicit and open from the start about your role as a journalist now if this applies to the story that you're starting to plan then you must conduct a risk assessment you must um, look at the risks involved in what you're planning to do and you need to uh, conduct that risk assessment properly identifying hazards and what steps you will take to minimize those or remove them um, and you need to do some research into that and you'll find lots of support at the university around risk assessment uh, contact me certainly to talk about that this might involve you using different email addresses for example if you're uh, operating on social media or you're giving out contact details you might want to use specific contact details that you only give out uh, in connection with this particular project so that uh, people if they pass on your details you can ditch those email addresses later if, if um, 
they're misused. So do think carefully about the contact details that you share and whether you might need to set up alternate contact details purely for this project. Certainly, if you're involved in anything undercover, you should read up on undercover reporting. You'll find some links uh, at, at that link, you'll find lots of resources related to that. Specifically, the BBC guidelines are a very good resource to give you an indication of how this is treated within uh, a news organisation and the sorts of steps that you should be going through too. And again, you should certainly talk to me about what you're considering. Even lurking, lurking is, is where you join some sort of online group, but you don't actually say anything. You just listen to what people are, said, are saying. That raises issues of privacy and people's expectations of privacy. Um, and you'll find literature on that activity and when it's appropriate and the considerations that you need to bear in mind. So again, with any of these, make sure you do your research, make sure you talk to me. Moving on then, one um, other framework which Hunter has put together, which is very useful also for organising your uh, project your investigation is what's sometimes called the master file and this is simply a spreadsheet which has four sheets or tabs in it and it's a way of keeping track of all the material that you're dealing with in your reporting the first tab contains the information about the story what happened when so it's basically a chronology of events so it allows you to keep track of all the events that you've been finding out about as you've been going about your reporting. The second tab is a documents tab. This is a way of keeping track of all the documents that you are using or have come across in your news gathering. That might be reports, it might be FOI requests, it might be data, it might be anything like that. The third tab is people. So Likewise, a list of all the people and contact details that you've been using. And the final tab is a source map, so the, the relationship of sources, um, you know, which sources you're trying to get hold of, a bit similar to this that we talked about earlier. In the examples of student work in the assessment section on Moodle, you'll find some previous student work where master files have been used. So you can see um, how it's used by them and you can use that template yourself as well. Now one other framework before um, I finish this video is the five hats or five roles in an investigation. Um, this is something I came up with a few years ago when I was working on the Help Me Investigate project. Um, Help Me Investigate was a networked collaborative investigative journalism uh, project and the idea is that people would collaborate on investigations. Now, when you are collaborating, you do need to organise um, the different roles that people have and, and try to ensure that all the different parts of a story are covered. And in the process of that, I identified five particular roles that I think it's useful to bear in mind. Whether that is that you are working in a group of five people, for example, or whether it's just you and you need to adopt a different role at different points in the story. Um, and I'll go through each in turn and just briefly detail what those involve. So the, the second hat, the curator hat, is probably the, the hat that you would adopt first of all. This is the role of curating all of the information related to the subject that you're looking into. So this is all the background information to uh, you know, let's say it was about stop and search, then you'd be finding all background reports and stories about that issue. You'd be finding all the context to it. So that's what the curator hat or role involves. The data journalist hat obviously involves collecting all the data related to that issue, what data is available, also what documents are available, because they often include document, uh, data as well. The multimedia hat is a role whereby you get um, video or audio that tries to bring your story to life a little bit. The most obvious example of that would be doing interviews with case studies and experts and other people involved in a story, basically putting a face on that story. 
It might also involve creating explainers and other material, but fundamentally it's about the human side of your story, making sure that you have interviews. And likewise, the community manager hat involves engaging with the communities that this issue, this story affects. Again, it might involve trying to find case studies and trying to understand the impact of the issue. Now, a community can take a number of different shapes. It might be the community, let's say we're talking about stop and search again. The obvious community here is the people who are stopped and searched. Are there particular communities that are stopped and searched more often, for example? But another community involved in that story is the policing community, a professional community, um, a community of people in particular jobs. So that would be part of it as well. So don't just think about community in the sense of people that live in a particular area or share a particular culture or a particular social environment. It's also people who work in a particular industry um, or who do the same sorts of things. Now, the final hat is the editor hat, and this is the role of coordinating and organising all of the other material that's gathered by the other people. It's also the role of checking all of that material and combining it and cutting out what is not needed in the story. One of the useful things about this framework is that it can help you identify which of these types of roles you might naturally gravitate to and which of those you naturally tend to avoid. And by thinking about that, it will help you identify areas that you probably need to make time specifically to do. So for example, it might be that you enjoy working with data, but not speaking to people, in which case you need to uh, invest a bit more time or allocate time specifically to those multimedia and community roles. Equally, it might be that you spend a lot more time curating background and reading background to stuff rather than looking at the data. So in that case, again, you'd need to allocate specific time to look at the data. You might spend a lot of time organising and not a lot of time doing. So in that case, you're more of an editor and you need to make sure that you allocate time to do the interviewing or the data work or the background work and so on. So I'm going to wrap up the video there. Just to end with some of the reading to do based on this, I've mentioned Story Based Inquiry. It is a fantastic book. Uh, will make a massive difference to your reporting. So I definitely recommend reading it and that's what you should do next. There are resources on some of the other approaches at the links below as well. And also you'll find uh, in these slides some videos from a um, MOOC, an investigative journalism MOOC, on investigative reporting in the digital age. And the first one is how to launch an investigation. Uh, that has some uh, really good tips on kind of identifying potential ideas for stories and then working through those. And, uh, and then the second video is tips on making an investigation easier to manage. Some things that you can do next. Uh, the first thing is to write a hypothesis for your idea. If you've got an idea for an investigation or a large feature, write that down as a hypothesis. Don't worry about it being factually correct, it's just about an example of the sorts of statement that you're trying to establish. Try to make it smart, so use those, um, that framework that I mentioned earlier about making it specific and measurable and time bound, so what's the deadline going to be, what's the outcome going to be and so on. And start to map out the sources that your story involves. Who's at the centre of your story? Who's connected to that person? What's the open sources that are available in your field? Who are the experts? What sorts of human sources are you going to need to talk to eventually? <laughs>